Well, I have been a little dismayed this week that is some have called for changes in our laws. Others have claimed that that politicizes this tragedy. I don't really get that. We are a nation of laws. The laws are arrived at through a political process, both through elections and then through debate and negotiations in state houses and on Capitol Hill. And my question today is, are these events likely to cause changes in the laws under which we live? Let's talk about it with political consultant uh, Dennis Darnoy here from Densar Consulting, political consultant Adolph Mongo back with us from Mongo and Associates, co-host of It's Just Politics on Michigan Radio Zoe Clark, and pollster and strategist Steve Mitchell of Mitchell Research. Gang, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, it's been a really awful, brutal week, and I, 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 I guess I wonder at what we can add to all of this. But Steve, my central question is, as we've watched this back and forth and we see polls where 90% or more of Americans do want to see maybe more uh, stringent background checks. Does any of that matter? Is anything going to move the needle? You can tell, you can do polling on specific issues related to it. But I looked at a, a survey last night conducted after the shooting down in Uvalde, Texas, and essentially 52% of the country wants to have stricter gun laws. 48%, however, say that either the gun laws are strict enough now or they should be more lenient. And when you've got half the country split like this, then there's no way you're gonna move forward any legislation because most of those people who want gun control legislation are in urban areas in more uh, democratic states and the ones who don't are in Republican states. The Senate controls it and you're not going to see any changes. Uh, Adolf, we've, <laughs> we, we now see, I, I, I can't even fathom it, guns are the leading cause of death among American children now. Is Listen, that... a couple of weeks ago we had 10 people shopping in a grocery store, uh, oh. mowed down by an 18 year old. And now, just the other day, another 18-year-old go into a school and kill our babies. And these folks in D.C. could care less. You know what? I was watching TV and, and one of former, uh, uh, an appointee under Obama said they need an Emmett Till moment mm. when they needed to see the carnage that this guy left, and I know you won't see it. It ain't that the DNA had they had to get DNA yeah, to identify yeah, yeah. these 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 babies. These are babies, and people used to make fun of Detroit public schools, saying, "Oh, they got metal detectors. Oh, it's dangerous to go in there." They was ahead of the game, and a lot of these schools do not want to accept the fact that they have walking time bombs walking the halls in their schools, and they're not dealing you, you with it. You bring up an important point because we debate that about uh, crime scene photos and what exactly um, we show <clears throat> and what we don't show. Do you sense any real push to change, or is it just still a bunch of talk? I think in the hearts of Americans, to Steve's point about asking questions, right, and mm -hmm. poll numbers, mm -hmm. if you asked Americans, do you want this to stop, you're going to get 100%. Yeah. So how do you then figure out how you take that anger and you take that sadness and figure something out? That is what these elected officials mm -hmm. are elected to do. That is why they get up and run. And the six-month anniversary of the Oxford shooting here in Michigan, yeah. that is on Tuesday. Six months. Here we are. Uh, Dennis, it's uh, interesting. You do look at some other countries that have had these horrific events, like in New Zealand, and they change the law the next month and uh, do a gun buyback program, get rid of assault weapons. And when, we talk, we po when you point those kind of things out, uh, the, the gun lobby in this country says, yeah, but uh, those are countries that don't have it written into their constitution, and the argument, the debate stops there. Correct. And nothing happened after Columbine. Yeah. Nothing happened after Sandy Hook. Nothing happened after Oxford, and I hate to say it, I don't think anything's going to change other than just constant debate about what should we do and what shouldn't we do. Gun safety is a, a predominant issue across campaigns, cycle after cycle, yet nothing does get done. Will it play into this, uh, in, into this coming? Uh, we've, got, we've got huge elections. We're going to, in fact, we're just about to, I want to move into our conversation about the governor's race here. Will it play in? No, I mean, I, I don't think so. It will be an issue, but honestly, the economy, inflation, things of mm -hmm. that nature, that's what's really going to drive this campaign and numbers at the federal level. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about uh, what happened this past week. We've had half of the gubernatorial slate of candidates uh, on the GOP side sliced away. 
you, we, we did a news story with you this week, Dennis, and you said, sorry, but this is elections 101. Somebody in the campaign has to be there checking the signatures that you have paid for. Absolutely. I mean, there are two things that happened. A massive fraud occurred, but also these campaigns were negligent. Uh, in, in following through on these signatures. There is a, a, every campaign knows that at the end of the week you meet, you ask, where are your signatures? What is our validation rate? Um, the reason you raise so much money for signatures is so that you get them checked. So, I mean, it is a shame that people back these candidates and these candidates won't be on the ballot, but they're the ones to blame. They're the ones who are at fault. And if you want to run the state of Michigan, you first have to know how to run your campaign. That's what it seems to me, Steve, and that's why I was a little surprised that the two Republican members of the Board of Canvassers sided with the uh, with these aggrieved candidates. Well, obviously Republicans are going to side with the Republican candidates <laughs> on this, but you need to change three. I, again, the obligation is on the candidate to get the right signatures, and what the process is, as Dennis so correctly says, is you bring the signatures in and you begin verifying immediately. Every week you're verifying. You're going to the clerks. You're making sure that they're not fraudulent. Anyone who looked at these signatures knew that there was something wrong. And yet apparently there was no internal quality check on what was going on. So it's very unfortunate. I don't believe the courts will allow them on. I think that they're off. I think that the, that the uh, two major candidates, the one with the most money and the one in the lead, uh, are not going to be uh, voted on in August because they were unable to yeah. do that. Uh, Adolf, it kind of exposes a little dirty secret. The idea that, that these candidates pay up to $20 per signature. Um, now, we, we all know that this is how it works. Quoting the, the, the great Fred Sanford. <laughs> You big dummy. <laughs> listen, any, a any lot of these, listen, <laughs> you look, if it doesn't pass the eye test, and I've done signatures, and, and signatures, it's a, I hate it. Yes. But you can look at some of these signatures and you know it, you, throw, you throw them out. Uh, chief Craig, listen, he was the chief for a long time here in the city. He built up a rapport with a lot of community people. Why didn't he go into the community? Mm -hmm. He would have got some good folks that would have got him the signatures, but he knows better than anybody. He, he's going to run his own campaign. He runs out all his campaign managers. He deserved every bit of this. Him and uh, Perry Johnson, they, they, they bragged about how great they were, and they couldn't even get 15,000 good mm. signatures, and they had all this time to get these signatures. Shame on them. Uh, they're gone. Bye-bye. Well, I, I, you know, Zoe, I sympathize with, the, with their plight a little bit because mm -hmm. they were defrauded. They mm -hmm. paid for something that they did, n did not end up getting. Mm -hmm. I assume Dana Nessel is going to go after uh, and look into what's happened mm -hmm. here. But this is really sloppy paperwork, and, it, and it, we've seen signatures. Uh, you know, we, I can we can name a couple of candidates mm -hmm. who are no longer in office mm -hmm. because we've had signature problems. Mm -hmm. Thaddeus but, McCotter. Thaddeus <laughs> McCotter. Mm -hmm. But but at this level, oh, we, this many at one time, it, it's astonishing. It's b beyond astonishing. I think I've heard Goat Rodeo uh, actually uttered more in the past few days than I have about I've Michigan politics. I've always felt politics. responsible for bringing that phrase to Michigan from Oklahoma. You're, thank so, you. We're grateful for that. Yes. It makes it so much easier to describe what's happening. Um, no, I mean, you know, it's absolutely astonishing. And, and you know, to have it yet again be about fraud and be about sort of democracy with a small d. And my concern is that it goes again into this sort of narrative that we have seen over the past few years about that there is just this unbearable willingness of some folks to just believe in our system. And if you don't get enough signatures, well, it shouldn't quite matter because of this, that, or that. We are a nation of laws and rules, and one of the ways to become governor is this is the first thing you do. Which is why, Dennis, I thought it would be kind of what they were asking was to put me on the ballot anyway. Well, mm -hmm. I guess I could show up and say, put me on the ballot. I didn't have signatures either. Yeah, I know. For, <laughs> for a party that's against, uh, you know, participation trophies, it seems like there are a number who want to be given this. But, you know, going back to the conversation that we had about guns and inaction, yeah. the truth of the matter is this could have been prevented. Yes. And what I mean by that is there is a bill in the Senate, which was introduced, State Senate, in July of last year, which says 
that you cannot employ signature gatherers who have election fraud convictions. The person who supposedly is at yes. the head of this was convicted twice or of two felonies in, in Virginia state, for this. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. again, this could have been prevented a long time ago, yet there was inaction at the legislative level. Mm -hmm. But look, you've got five candidates who made it on the ballot. Tudor Dixon got uh, mm -hmm. 29,735, mm -hmm. which is almost what the governor got. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, it can be done legally, You've and, got and it can be done quality right. guru should have been done right. Quality it, guru. It, it, it seems to <laughs> on know? most years. So where does the advantage tilt now? What what happens with the, the we're left with five? Um, what happens now? Oh, I think with the DeVos back, family backing Tudor Dixon, she becomes the uh, odds-on favorite for the nomination, and she'll be a very strong candidate in the general election. I mean, it's ten, sorry, it's 10 weeks until we go into the primary, mm -hmm. so having that type of backing is going to kind of be like a jetpack on her candidacy. Yeah. Absolutely, you know, and Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky, right, was sort of one of the first to come out and, and, and endorse her even before the name ID or necessarily the money was there. And she's also going to, you know, be now the only woman uh, who's going to be running in this primary against a, a female sitting governor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's going to be really interesting, though. I, I do think you need to watch still Kevin Rinke, the businessman, um, you know, at the GOP uh, debate in Livingston County, he was trying to thread some needles there about maybe trying to push a little bit to the more moderate direction, which doesn't you get you through a, mm -hmm. through a primary, right, right? right? But it does help in a general. And, you know, we're still, as we've talked many times at this table about the intra-party fight within the Republican Party yep. and what happens on August 2nd yep. and, and how does this split yet again? And, and so I'm watching him and just how he's trying to thread that needle, which is happening all over the across the country. We don't have an endorsement from Donald Trump yet. What will that role mm -hmm. play in mm -hmm. this? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, it, it depends on what part of the country you're in. In, in some parts of the country, they love Donald Trump. In other well, we're parts, in Michigan. How's that going? <laughs> well, you know, I think it's a mixed bag. 80, I think eighty eighty percent of the vote of Republican Party primary voters will vote for a candidate that Donald Trump endorses. And you go it's a huge in You go primary. north. But, but north the big problem for the Democrats, yeah. the big problem for the Democrats, the governor got to step up her game. And it's, it's not going to be an, an, an easy ride uh, in November. Plus, she got folks here in Detroit. And, and if she says, OK, I got them in the bag, she's going to have a Hillary moment. Because you know, you're going to have to get people out work. to vote. I got to get to a break. <laughs>